So, without further ado, let's start. Um, hello, everybody. Hey, Everybody, by and large here, should know who I am. I realise that there's, I think, literally a handful of people who've came along to the talk today who don't really know who I am. So I have to start with the obligatory introduction as to who I am, and then we can get on to the good stuff. So, as you can see, this is my contact information here. I am Dr. Tommy Thompson. What I do and how I go about it, I'm about to explain in a minute. You can get a hold of me on Twitter at get to the chopper. Don't forget the underscores. I don't know why I put my Twitter account on this. I just thought this might be more relevant to like kids these days. It's like, oh yeah, we'll tweet about it. We'll tweet about it. Um, what this series is about is actually largely adapted from a YouTube channel and my own website blog that I run, which is hosted over on Patreon uh, at patreon.com forward slash AI and games. This is like sort of a, it's sort of like a Kickstarter where you sponsor people who make cool stuff. And I like to make cool stuff about AI and video games. And what we're going to see today shortly is sort of an amalgamation of a couple of different topics that I've put up on my website. Um, and just trying to really sell to you something that a lot of people don't often appreciate. So first things first, better get the, the important thing about it. What is my job? My job is I'm a lecturer in computer science. I am also the program leader for the BSc in computer games programming, which the majority of people in this room are studying. Make some noise. Yay. Who booed? <laughs> I've got the attendance list. I'll find you. Um, but more importantly, the thing, that's, the thing that gets me out of bed, sorry, it's not you guys, um, I'm a researcher in artificial intelligence. My, most of my postgraduate study has been focused on artificial intelligence. I have a master's in AI from the University of Edinburgh, dated from way too far back to the point I feel really embarrassed about it. 2006, I think. Um, I also attained a PhD in artificial intelligence in 2010 from the University of Strathclyde, which is in Glasgow. And that was focus, focusing specifically on how AI applications uh, can be done in video games. So, I like to talk about uh, AI research, I teach AI research, and I have students, there are people in the crowd right now whose work will actually appear at some point, or at least they have done something in this area. So, what is this series about? Like I said, this is part one, we're going to have several of these over the next couple of months, and it's really just to point out that AI is far more pervasive uh, in terms of commercial products as well as research than most people actually realise. Um, Typically, everyone seems to associate it more with science fiction rather than science fact, but artificial intelligence has been applied quite heavily since about the late 1950s onwards. And the thing is that we actually use it an awful lot in video games, either for commercial purposes, which is something we'll come back to throughout the series, um, but also in academic research. And very few people seem to know that. Certainly, AI research in games has had a sort of something of a resurgence uh, in the last 10 years, and nobody knows. It's like, you tell people about some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about in this talk, and they don't, they don't know this happens. I'm like, that's so disappointing. So let's take some time, and this is entirely what today's talk is about, is looking at what AI researchers have been doing in video games, why they've actually been mucking around in video games, and why it's so important to us. So artificial intelligence, it's a nice buzzword. People seem to associate it. Well, I would ask you, what would you associate artificial intelligence with? Terminator. Terminator. <laughs> Whenever you say artificial intelligence, everyone seems to gravitate towards science fiction. You move towards the notion of usually evil robots that have this, you know, tendency to try and wipe out the human race. Um, we seldom think about them in the context of how the real world works or how artificial intelligence works in the real world. It's all about big, evil, scary robots. Um, I'm assuming most people have seen the Terminator unless you're of a certain age, but I trust that your parents will educate you in the right way when you're old enough. I think this is still a 15, by the way. Um, but this is you know, often applicable. Now, I, I love this slide. I threw it together years ago. and It was just a collection of different AI that you see in a variety of you know, um, video games, comic books, movies, and most of you are able to identify with at least one of these. But many of them, there's very, very few of them that are not out to kill us or hurt us or do something to the detriment of the human race. And it's actually for a, a really simple reason in that the principle of artificial intelligence is it revolves around agents. And what agents do 
is that they make intelligent decisions based upon what's happening around them. So, in fact, when you think about it, um, one movie I would actually pick out, which is great to show intelligent agents, is Wally for about the first 10 minutes. Now, for those of you who have not seen it, or, or you know, a bit of a, a rough memory, the beginning of Wally is all about how he is one of a handful of robots that are still left on Earth after we've made a bit of a mess of it. And he's going around and just trying to compact all the rubbish into cubes, and he builds towers of cubes of rubbish. So that eventually we can then, like, I don't know, stuff, stuff it all on Mars or something like that, just get rid of it. You know, turn Mars into a landfill. Now, that's actually great, because if you think about the beginning of Wally, he's moving around the environment, he is making intelligent decisions, because he wants to reach something so he can actually sc scoop up all the rubbish, but he has to navigate a hazardous terrain. And he knows what his job is, and he continues to do it. That's why you see massive towers of these like, compacted rubbish cubes. But the thing is that, in, you know, in terms of our um, literature, is that a key point is that he also has to be rational. And what rational means is that he has to always make sure he's doing what is the best possible thing he can do at any given point in time. Now, that sort of flies in the face of a lot of science fiction, because then, of course, in Wally, -E, he gets rather... Well, first of all, he's, he's got a kind of tendency to collect junk, which goes against his rational decision-making because he's supposed to be just compacting stuff. He also then becomes rather infatuated with Eva, who lands on the planet and then tries to run away from him because she actually has some sort of directive that she's following. She's far more rational for the majority of the movie than he is. Um, but he becomes rather, you know... Attracted to her, I guess, I suppose you could say. That there's some sort of like twisted little uh, love, uh, love story in there. And it's quite sweet, but at the same time, I get really, really annoyed. Because he's becoming less and less like an AI the longer the movie goes on. And all the parents are going, oh, that's sweet. Look at it. The robots are holding hands. I'm like, yeah, I shouldn't be holding hands. There's no reason for you to be holding hands. So <clears throat> the thing about him being a rational agent is typically also the biggest problem. Because rational action means that we often avoid things such as morals, such as ethics. And that's when somebody like Megatron comes along. Because Megatron doesn't really have an issue with the fact that he is going to drain all of our energy sources on Earth and then wipe out the human race in the process, because he's a rational agent. Megatron. <laughs> he's, he knows what he's doing. He's doing the right thing. But of course we freak out because it's like, no, it's an army of robots that are coming from a foreign planet and they're here to wipe us out. That's not good. That's not cool. But no, that's, that's kind of what we're expecting. So this is why, you know, typically whenever you think about AI, you gravitate towards evil killer robots. It's not the goal. It just seems to work out like that all the time. So <clears throat> how does AI work within games? Well, there's two strands that I'm largely involved with. The first part is that many video games will adopt some form of AI as part of their gameplay. Um, traditionally, this has been non-player characters, and this can go back even to the earliest of days. A really crude AI might have been implemented, excuse me, in video games, uh, just to have some sort of difficulty or challenge. In time, these have gradually become much smarter and more complex. Uh, we're even seeing some really engaging and exciting non-player characters, even just this month, what with the release of both Alien Isolation and the Lord of the Rings Shadow of Mordor game, both of which I've yet to play. I'm interested to try them out. Uh, one of the two of the bigger things that are one is having a resurgence, which is procedural content generation, which actually became quite popular in the 1980s because, in fact, it started out with games such as Elite because they didn't have enough memory to store all the content they wanted, so they figured out they could actually write a system that would procedurally generate star systems in the game for you to explore. So you could have an infinite number of possibilities and a very finite amount of memory. Nowadays, they're trying to do it in order to ensure player retention. So players are coming back and playing your video games more and more. Um, the other kind of big innovation, I'd say, is director systems, which was pioneered by the likes of Left 4 Dead by Valve, where the AI is actually a governing system which oversees your gameplay and then tries to maintain sort of a player experience of like peaks and troughs of activity. So, that it, so maybe there are periods where you're getting quite panicked, and you fight your way through it, and if you survive it, it then tails off, and it gives you a moment to breathe. <clears throat> and I'll be coming back to talk about that. But today, really, it's actually about how AI researchers, like myself and others, like to experiment with video games for a number of reasons. And 
one of the things that we like to do is to investigate how we can improve existing AI. And video games are really useful for that. We can also actually create entirely new AI systems because we realize that a game allows us to finally tackle that problem we've never had a chance to do. And also to improve upon existing game ideas. And, you know, procedural generation in particular has become a big thing in sort of the last five years within sort of AI research circles. <clears throat> so, the all important thing, what, what do we do and how do we go about it? And it, typically it revolves around an AI algorithm that plays a video game. You physically remove the human player, you build an interface in code between the game itself and your AI system, and your AI system then plays the video game. Which is really weird at first. I always remember like, one of the first projects I ever did in AI, um, we had, it was actually a Pac-Man game, which is kind of apt, but it was this project I was supervising with a student, and the second marker who came along, who was a professor in computer science, had no, I think his interests were in safety critical systems, so nothing to do with AI, was completely blown away, and the phrase, but it plays itself, was iterated, you know, it just continually spouted this out, and we're saying, what do you think, you think this is an interesting piece of work? It plays itself! It's like, yes, yes, that's what an artificially intelligent system will do. It plays the video. But it's playing itself. I didn't know you could do that. Not surprisingly, he got a good grade for it. I think I was a much harsher marker than the second guy was because he just couldn't get over the fact that it was playing itself. Um, <clears throat> and then one of the things that we like to do is we like to use a, a number of algorithms that can actually learn or adapt to that game in particular. So we never, often the emphasis is not to create an algorithm that works solely on that game. We're taking an existing algorithm we've already got and we see how well that works in that particular context because something about that game is unique and we've not tried that game out um, just yet. Maybe we've tried out games A and B, but we haven't tried it in game C and there's something, there's an interesting property in game C that makes us say, right, well, we're going to do this in this game as well. Now, Again, you might be thinking, well, wh why, why are you doing this? I mean, surely you can't make a career out of that. So what's a game to a human being? Why do you play games? Gee, I mean, I'm actually in a room where a lot of the people here are students on a computer games programming degree. So I'm hoping one of you could answer that question. Why do you play video games? Right at the back. To avoid doing coursework. I suppose that's true. It's not the answer I'm looking for. Other man at the back. Entertainment. Entertainment. Okay. Well, making money, I suppose that's one thing. But primarily, it's about entertainment. We actually do it, you know, it's, it's a break. We do it to enjoy ourselves. And largely, the thing is that games are stimulation for the brain. It sounds a little weird when you say it like that. But it's something that your, your brain is excited about. We often provide it with these unique experiences where the opportunity for reward, you're rewarded in video games for doing well at them. And you feel good about that. There's a sense of empowerment that comes with that. Anybody who plays a lot of uh, you know, um, video games where you're cutting down large swathes of enemies, particularly if you go and play the likes of Saints Row, or you're playing as the Incredible Hulk or another superhero and you're fighting off you know, whole hordes of enemy characters. You feel empowered by the fact that you did that. You feel good about it. Um, so it's really just food for the brain, and it doesn't really matter what that game is, because you know, different people like different things. I mean, you, how many people do you know at some point or another like to sit and do the Sudoku in the newspaper, or they'll go and buy like, a book of 500 Sudoku problems? And they'll go away and just burn through it gradually. Might not be one of you guys, but maybe like your gran or your mum or somebody like that. I realise I'm stereotyping a little bit there. Um, but you tend to find, you know, older generations still like to do crossword puzzles in the paper. I don't because I haven't bought a paper since about 2001. And I think it was because something free was in it. <laughs> I can't remember even what it was. Um, card games, which have had a little bit of a resurgence in the last sort of 10 years or so. Specifically there, I've actually picked out the Game of Thrones card game. So people like to play games like that, but then it can also extend to board games. Uh, Ticket to Ride, which I don't know if you've played it. It's a really good one. Um, a friend of mine, Graham, has it, and we've played it a few times. It's a good laugh. And then naturally, of course, it moves on to video games. Now, <clears throat> each of these games can then task you in completely different ways. So we sometimes look at lateral thinking, where we're taking 
We're actually making deductions, inference, as we're going through, that if I do this, then this will happen. And that kind of ties into long-term deliberation. When you're playing Sudoku, you're always having to think about what impact placing one number in one place will have. Subsequently, there's a kind of combination, I guess, of long-term deliberation and reactions when you're playing video games, particularly if it's Halo, because you're trying to strategize what you're doing, even over the horizon of maybe the next 10 seconds. <coughs> Excuse me, but you're having to pay attention to the fact that things are happening around you. So other players are involved, they're maybe going to try and take you out, you have to respond to that in kind. So because things are real, you know, because games are good for humans, they're good for AI by extension. And to me that's rather obvious because if something's designed to be tasking for you, then clearly it's going to be interesting for an AI to solve it. We're deliberately creating problems for our brains and if there's one thing that an AI needs is more problems to try and solve. So why not give it something that humans throw at themselves on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to entertain themselves? Because clearly they're solvable, otherwise it wouldn't be a game, would it? If it was an impossible problem, well, we're not going to give that to an AI, because what's the point? And also you're just going to end up getting really you know, frustrated, your blood pressure is going to shoot up, what have you. The, the, the term we like to use is a benchmark. And you'll find that, you know, particularly in artificial intelligence research, Benchmarks appear in a lot of different places. Different subdomains of AI like to have certain benchmarks they like to throw at their algorithms to see how effective they are. And a community will gravitate towards like a collection of benchmarks that they use on a regular basis. In this particular corner of the world, we're actually defined largely by the fact that we use games as benchmarks. And there's a community that's then kind of gathered around that. And like I said, the different games have unique properties that make them interesting. And the immediate ones that come to my mind is determinism which I'll see in again in a minute. Determinism is when if I do, if I'm standing in one position and I do one thing, I know what the outcome of that thing will be. So perhaps if I'm standing where I am, I take one step forward, I know that's going to happen because, well, one, I'm, I'm assuming that I've figured out how to walk and I'm not drinking, okay? Um, because there's nothing else in the way, this is a clean path, I can make that step one bit forward. You know, if maybe I was dizzy or I was blind or there was an obstacle in the way and I hadn't paid attention to it and I could trip and I could fall, then the confidence of whether or not that action would actually complete could be opened up. The easiest thing actually in the world to consider for determinism is a coin toss or a dice roll because automatically you don't know what that's going, what's, that, what's going to happen. If you roll a dice, unless you've weighted it, you don't know what the outcome of that dice roll is going to be. You just hope it's going to be a particular outcome. That's non-determinism right there. It's an element of randomness. The accessibility of information, whether or not you can actually see certain things. So if you're playing uh, games like Sudoku or you're playing uh, drafts, you're playing chess, you can see the full board that's in front of you. You can then make decisions based upon that. Um, if you're playing poker, you can't because the whole thing about poker is you're trying to bluff against other players because you have a good idea. You maybe have a rough inclination of what cards they have, but you can't say with any complete confidence. Um, there's also the notion of whether or not the game is static or dynamic in the sense that if it's chess, it's okay. You can take as much time as you like to make your decision. Nobody's going to you know, interfere. If it's you're playing Halo, that's a completely different circumstance because someone can run out of nowhere and shoot you in the head. I'm pretty sure I would play chess a lot faster if I knew at some point in a given time some guy would come out of nowhere and try and shoot me in the head. In fact, it doesn't matter where he was going to shoot me. If he's going to shoot me, I'm going to be a bit, you know, just knock the king down, I'm off, run out the door. And also whether other people are in play. So things like, um, you know, if it is Sudoku, that's fine. You're up against a sheet of paper. That sheet of paper is not going to change. And it's not like the Sudoku puzzle is going to change while you're working on it. If it does, I, I don't know what's going on there. You might need to see a doctor. Um, but if, again, if you're playing multiplayer games on consoles or PC, whatever else, you're dealing with other characters. These might be AI, they might be human, and they're going to do something while you're in the middle of trying to like, figure out what you want to do, and you have to factor that into your decisions. So the other thing is that video games often provide us with a simulation of something that we can't do in the real world. Research is actually a very time-consuming and expensive process. And... If I say to someone, I'm going to figure out the best AI system ever that flies a plane, I'm pretty sure the university will not give me a plane just to try it out on. 
Because one, I don't have a pilot's license. Two, you wouldn't trust a mad scientist to hook up his AI system to a plane, particularly when he's never tested it. And we like to have simulations to test. And it can be like a lot of real world phenomena like racing cars. There is actually games such as the uh, Torx engine, which is actually a game engine designed to do kind of realistic physics simulations in a video game environment. And people race and play the Torx engine. Airplane control, like I just said, you wouldn't trust me to just plug in my software and go, it'll be fine. Crashes somewhere in the middle of the A38. University ends up with a massive lawsuit in its hands and I go and find a job at McDonald's. Strategic combat, this is actually a very serious concern. I mean, both airplane control and strategic combat are considered on a military level. The military is actually considering looking at AI systems and some people actually use games as a means to simulate environments that they're going to use so they can actually then test out their AI systems for actual military purpose. In the long run, some of the research that people actually do can actually have an impact uh, in military hardware. Or, you know, being Batman, I guess. I mean, it's not a real world phenomena, but yeah, if you want to be Batman, you can be Batman, and being Batman's kind of cool. Except for the parental issues and darkness. Um, good to sing the song. Uh, the money's good, but beyond that, it's not really a job worth having. Um, also, th like I said, that it's, it's a lot less expensive to work in these environments. It's also a lot less safety critical, and that's kind of the point I was getting at. If you let me drive a car, or you let me drive a tank, or an airplane with my AI system, there's going to be risks attached to that. Uh, naturally, there's monetary risks, but also there are moral risks in terms of and ethical risks in case I actually hurt someone. And, you know, research institutions and universities typically have an ethical process to ensure that I don't put in a commission and ask for, like, a decommissioned tank. I've tried. They didn't let me have it. I got my first warning, I think, not long after that. So we can then deploy some of our algorithms in real-world problems once we've tested them in games. Now, a lot of researchers actually do this, that they have a nice game, and they can go, look, this, this algorithm actually works really well in these domains. And while it's a video game, it actually evokes similar properties to things that happen in the real world. Let's try this out and actually move towards actually applying this in the real world. And this has actually happened. I'm not going to go into that too much today, I'm afraid. One of the things that, that does come up, though, repeatedly is the moral issue with that. And we're seeing this a lot more in the media recently, what with the likes of UAV strikes taking place out in the Middle East. That is an artificially intelligent system that is attacking civilians by accident, potentially, in a foreign country. Where does the, where does the blame stop there? This is almost getting into the, you know, gun manufacturer versus the person that fires the gun problem. Where does the buck stop? Who actually takes responsibility for what an AI system does when you deploy it in the real world? But we're not dealing with the real world. So, you know, it's all good. Everyone's like getting really glum now. Like, oh no, horrible real world things. We're not doing real world things. We're talking about games. So, back when I was a lad, I was 16 when that paper came out. John Laird and Michael Van Lentz, who are researchers, I think it was the University of Michigan, had wrote a paper. Um, they wrote a couple of papers, originally in 2000 and again in 2001, about how AI was going, like, um, video games were going to be the human level AI's killer app. And by killer app, they meant that this is going to be the one domain where AI is actually going to dominate, and it's going to really help justify why we're continuing to do AI research. Once we can see what people can do in video games, this, this will be a big deal. People will love it. And the thing was that AI was a bit of a sore point in terms of valid research for a while. And this actually dates back to the 1970s. Because in the 1970s, um, back when AI was becoming a big thing, a lot of governments uh, in Europe and in America were sort of trying to push for more and more AI research to be conducted because they thought that they could actually break the problem. And a lot of the time, it was looking at things like how to play chess or drafts or games of that ilk and saying, hey, if we can solve this, we can solve like so many problems in the AI domain. Now, the thing is, that didn't work. We still haven't solved chess. We've solved drafts, but we haven't solved chess yet. And the thing was that governments got very tired. They get very frustrated and they said, right, where's my super killer robot? We're still trying to figure out how chess works. Is that right? 
Okay, so they started pulling the funding back. And it's actually referred to in literature as the AI winter, when a lot of research institutions weren't given funding to do AI research because they thought governments largely thought it was a dead end. And it's only really, I'd say, in the last kind of 10, 20 years that this has came back. And in the last 10 years in particular, we're really kind of pushing this off again. Now, we'll start off by looking at one game that in the early 1990s people were suggesting would actually be a good idea. That's Pac-Man. Way! Pac-Man, for those of you who are too young to know what it is, is one of the most successful arcade games ever. It has sold over 400,000 units. And apparently, up, but somewhere between 1980 and its release, up until I think 1999, $2.5 billion worth of quarters were put into arcade machines to play Pac-Man. It's a lot of money. Also, that amount of quarters at once would probably kill you. Just turn you into mush. Like a tidal wave of quarters. Just imagine that. Tsunami of quarters. It's going to hurt. You'll be really rich if you can avoid it all and then just scoop it all up when you're done. But by and large, it's going to be very, very painful. Now, what happened was actually in the early 90s, John Cosa and Justinian Rosca had actually suggested, you know what would be great? We could do what we're doing in Pac-Man. That'd be a great idea. Didn't do it. But they were like, oh, you know, this would be a really cool idea. And what they were working on is a field called genetic programming. And that's a research area where you write a system that writes software. And what they were thinking about is the fact that Pac-Man is built around mazes. And we're going to see a bit of footage in a minute, for those of you who don't remember what it looks like. You're going to navigate around mazes and you're trying to collect pills because that helps increase your score. And there's a fundamental logic to everything you do. Certain contexts will say, well, if ghosts are coming, the bad guys, the ghosts are coming to attack me, I'm going to find a way to avoid them. So they thought that this would be a really interesting test bed. So let's have a look at some actual gameplay. So this has been ripped off of an actual arcade cabinet. This is the original game. It might be a bit loud in a minute, in which case I might have to turn it down. But what they were, what they were saying was that they thought it was really interesting that because there's, there's fundamental logic in how you play Pac-Man, they could then dictate how you were going to do it. Cool. I don't think it's that noisy. That's worked out quite nicely. So there you are, you're Pac-Man in the bottom, and you're trying to chomp up as many pills as you possibly can, and there are four ghosts that are trying to take you down, Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and Clyde. Now the thing is that each of those ghosts have a very prescribed behavior. They always do the same thing. They always know in a given context, if you give them a certain set of inputs, and they always pay attention to where Pac-Man is, they will respond accordingly. I can't remember the particulars of it, but one of them, I believe, heads directly for where Pac-Man was. One tries to get ahead of him. One tries to, I think, also then t figure out where the guy who's, a, who's trying to go ahead of him and tries to go ahead of him. It's all rigid. And the thing is that um, professional Pac-Man players can tell you, not maybe not precisely, but on an almost intimate level, on a subconscious level, they can tell you how the bots play in that game, which means they've actually figured out how to avoid it. And that's quite straightforward. But you can see here that there's a lot here in terms of logic that you would continue to move towards certain locations and try and grab pills. If a ghost moves towards you, you then try and avoid it. Of course, if you then grab the power pill, you're then going to try and attack the ghosts because that's going to help you maximize your score. So, you know, Koza and Roska were thinking that this is, oh, this is a great domain for this. We should be doing a lot of research on how to make Pac-Man. And... It was a nice idea, and then it finally kind of kicked off in kind of 2001. Because uh, Yamper and Simon did a little bit of work where they used a genetic algorithm in neural networks. And a neural network is a, math is, a, is a software model that acts like a brain. You have a number of neurons in that brain, and what you do is you pass in information, and it processes it, and it comes up with an answer. So if you tell it where everybody else is, it then goes, right, okay, I figured out where all the ghosts are, I should go left, or I should go right. But you have to tailor that brain. It's sort of like your own brain. You, you come out when you're a child, you don't really know what you're doing. You're still, you know, sticking your face in things that you shouldn't and trying to do things you can't, sticking fingers in places that you shouldn't, potentially electrocuting yourself. And that's, you know, parents are so stressed out because they have to look after their child because they're bordering on 
self-harm half the time, but that's because you don't know any better, you learn. That's kind of what happens here, is, is that they don't actually know what they're doing and they learn over time to become better. Now the problem was that, yeah, this seemed like a really good idea, and they're like, yeah, we've done it in Pac-Man, except it wasn't quite what we were expecting. I realize this isn't what I sold you guys on when you said you were coming to this talk. But that was their idea. And they're like, hey, look, it's, it's Pac-Man-esque. It's a maze. What they meant was it's a maze with bad guys chasing you. And that wasn't great. You know, Gallagher and Ryan then went off and continued to do this. And again, it was a similar thing that they were evolving AI systems. They're learning AI systems that can solve these problems. And it, it used a clone, but still not all that accurate. It was a little bit more accurate, but the ghost didn't behave correctly. And also there are very subtle elements of how Pac-Man plays in terms of uh, navigating, in terms of turning corners, and also the speed of the ghosts at certain points in time. As Pac-Man moves towards finishing the level, the ghosts actually get slightly faster. And I can't remember, I think it's the, I think it's the ghosts can c turn corners faster than Pac-Man can by like a very minute amount, it's like two frames, something ridiculous, but they are actually faster than him. And these things, this is the problem that everyone's going, well, this is kind of cool, but we're not using the real game. And there's a real problem with trying to use the real game because if you go up to a games company and say, hi, I am Dr. Blah, 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 and I'm making a video game research thing and I want the source code to your video game. They say, no, I don't care what your research interests are. If you're not going to make me money, I don't want to work with you. You're like, oh. Fine. Many a dead end have been had. So this actually got resolved um, by a team in Essex. And this is when they actually stopped working on Pac-Man altogether. So they were kind of interested in Pac-Man. They said, well, no, let's go and do Ms. Pac-Man. Ms. Pac-Man's far more interesting. Now, if we have a look at Ms. Pac-Man, it's largely the same game. For those of you who've never played it, same principle, moving around, trying to navigate, you know, navigate the maze, eating as many pills as you possibly can, maximizing your score. There are some minor cosmetic changes, such as Clyde has been replaced by Sue, and Pac-Man now wears a bow. Because it's Ms. Pac-Man, I guess. I don't know. Um, oh my god! It's loud. This one's got audio. So, same principle as before. Now, there's nothing here so far that's anything different. There's some cosmetic changes in terms of what the ghosts are, well, in terms of how the ghosts look, what the ghost names are, what Pac, what Ms. Pac-Man, and the fact that it's now a woman, and also the maze is a little bit different. That's about it, in terms of that, you know, and the maze isn't that important. We might think it's important for us, but for an AI system, it just simply adapts to these changes. The big thing that breaks this from the original game is that the ghosts no longer do what they used to do. So they have their prescribed behavior, where they'll always do what they're supposed to do, but at any junction, they also have the option of doing something completely random. That causes a big problem. Because if it does something random, it means that we can no longer predict it. And the term for that is that it's now non-deterministic. So now we can't say with 100% confidence at any point in the map what that ghost's going to do. That makes this game significantly harder than the original. And that's even observed when you actually look at the top scores by human expert players of Pac-Man versus Ms. Pac-Man. The score on Pac-Man is significantly higher than Ms. Pac-Man because people can't score as well. It's a tougher game to play. So everyone got really excited about this. They're like, yeah, Ms. Pac-Man, let's do this one, let's do this one. But can we stop doing the kind of Mickey Mouse um, simulations that we're doing and actually work on the real game? So what they did was the team at Essex, and this was led by uh, Professor Simon Lucas, decided that they would build a framework that could actually look at the game and then communicate at it directly. And so this is a screen grab from a couple of years ago where they actually started running this as a competition. And they opened it up to researchers across the world and said, make the best Ms. Pac-Man player you possibly can. Now what we're about to see is actually the referred to as the Ice Pambush 3 robot. And Ice Pambush is because it's for the Institute of uh, Computer Entertainment, which is at Ritsumaiken University in Japan. 
What we're seeing over in the top right is, of course, our game of Miss Pac-Man. But in the bottom left, what's happening is the software is actually looking at the game. It does a screen grab and then breaks down the screen into chunks and tries to figure out what it can see. And you can see down here, there's actually Miss Pac-Man on the go. You can see all the ghosts moving around. And periodically, there's a red line because Miss Pac-Man figures out where the closest ghost is. And this is, in fact... Just, I think it's a Java applet which is running the original Ms. Pac-Man game. And in the top corner there, you can actually see what action it is doing on that frame. And that's an entirely AI system, just sitting playing the game. It's trying to do the best it can. And if I remember right, Ice Pan Bush 3 was like the top ranked AI player uh, for a good couple of years. And it's pretty good, I'd say. It still makes a couple of silly mistakes. And uh-oh, it's going to have a problem in a minute, I think. It's better than me. Look at it that way. Ah, no, there we go. Now, by AI standards, it's like, say, well, how good is it? We can now get to several levels in. We can now get a, quite a decent high score. The high score on this test right now, you can see on this build, is uh, 17,000 points, which I still think is probably better than me. Uh, but it's not quite up there with human play yet, but compared to the average human being, what AI systems are now able to do is actually better than most of us. I'm pretty sure if I got most people in here to play Ms. Pac-Man, they wouldn't score as well as they're doing now. Now, the other thing that came along was they said, well, that's kind of cool, but couldn't we do more than just learning how to play as Pac-Man? They also wanted to learn to play as the ghosts because the ghosts should be working in a coordinated fashion. They should be kind of gathering together, figuring out how to take out Pac-Man as quickly as possible. So they made a, a new clone which tried to accurately represent the game as close as they could because they couldn't figure out how to actually control the ghosts because the ghosts weren't, you know, the original game, sure, you can access Pac-Man's controls, but maybe not with the ghosts. So this is actually from one of the competitions from a few years ago. Uh, the Pac-Man is also, it's not the same as, it's not the same ice robot, it is ice, ice bot. It's also been made by the Ritsumaiken um, University in Japan. The ghosts, on the other hand, are actually written, and this is a weird one. So this is, uh, I think, the, 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 the code name for the ghost team is called Memetex. Memetex. And the developer is a British psychotherapist. Guy is not of a computer science background whatsoever. I think Daryl Toes, I think his name was. I can't remember off the top of my head. And what he did was he became so um, you know, interested in the problem, he learned Java and then wrote the build. He wrote his own ghost team and submitted it. And it's the, it was at that time, I think this was about 2011 or 2012, it was the top ranked ghost team in our competition. And when it was like, oh, who is this guy? Where does he come from? And it's just, he's got a, you know, you can go and book a session for counselling. Doesn't work in computer science whatsoever, has no interest in computer science, but loved the idea of making his own little Pac-Man ghost team. And there you go. And you can see here that it's, it's still kind of hard to do. And Pac-Man is really struggling. Ah! You can moment that, I like that, the little moments of indecision when he can't figure out what to do. Bloody hell. Now, actually, he should have been caught by now if we were using an accurate representation of the game because the ghost should have been able to turn that corner faster and they would have taken him out. So he's actually going to survive, I think, a couple of levels before he finally gets taken out. And it's quite impressive to see because if you look at what the ghosts are doing, sometimes, like, over... You can actually see right now that they kept gravitating around power pills because they know that's what he's going to go for. So some of them are attacking him directly whereas others are trying to sort of do a perimeter check around areas that he might be interested in, which is something that the original ghost didn't do. And as soon as they can see that he's going to be a problem, they start kind of driving to, yeah, see, look at this, so close. I could just watch this, I don't have to say anything for a minute or two. Finally got him, finally got him, her, sorry, I forget, this is Ms. Pac-Man, it's a lady. Or cross-dresser. I could never tell. It's exactly, look, he's out with the same. It's just there's a bow in the head. I don't know. Maybe it's Ms. Pac-Man at the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> they should just have a sound effect there, but it's, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> ah! 
There we go. Taken out. Finally lost. Now, this is a big deal. That we actually do this on a regular basis. Every year, there are a number of competitions that come up in different games for different purposes. And Pac-Man sort of helped pioneer that. Pioneers, and Pac-Man has actually been kind of quiet for the last couple of years. We've not had a Pac-Man competition. I think it's going to come back soon. But in the meantime, other competitions have sort of risen and actually then been finished or evolved into something else. And so we'll move on to something a little bit different. Super Mario. Everybody knows Super Mario. It's the most popular video game franchise in the world. When you actually do the top 10 <coughs> of biggest selling AI, franchi oh, was it AI franchises, video game franchises in the world, you can just see how low Call of Duty actually is. You know, The Sims has sold more copies than Call of Duty. They like to make so much noise about it when it actually is not really sold that much. Um, Mario has over 260 million copies sold in like the 30 year history of the Italian plumber. And <coughs> when we were interested in this was because it provided something different. And this kicked off only a couple of years after Pac-Man sort of started becoming a big thing. And the reason for that was that, well, it was something new it was something different because Mario is all about platforming. So we're trying to figure out how to, if you actually distill it into its purest of senses, you're trying to get from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen without getting hurt. That's it. That is all Mario is on a very kind of fundamental level. And that's how a lot of AI approaches to solve it have actually came about. Also, one of the things that actually helps, and you see this with some of the, some of the competitions that have been done that we don't talk about here, it's because they use a video game that nobody really knows. So Pac-Man was a big thing. So it's like, hey, Pac-Man, look at this. Here's Pac-Man, here's Pac-Man. But then Super Mario, everybody knows what Super Mario is. And subsequently, both the Pac-Man and Mario competitions have received a lot of interest outside of AI research. You can see articles in the likes of Wired. They're over on Kotaku. You know, New Scientist. A lot of, you know, outside of our immediate circle, people have paid attention to this because it's actually a big deal. Thing is... What we wanted to do was actually make systems that could play a Mario game. And this kind of kicked off largely due to a, a master student, Sergei Karakovsky, who was over at uh, Itzia in Switzerland. And he was supervised by AI researcher uh, Julian Togelius, um, who is quite a big, he's quite a big name, I suppose, now in our field these days. Uh, still can't hold his liquor, but he's a nice guy. Won't say anything nasty about it. Uh, Julian, he's a lovely guy. So they did this bit of research out back in 2009. And they said, look at this. We've actually got a little simulation of Mario. And we've got people, we've got this AI that can play Mario. And what they were doing was, again, using an evolutionary algorithm. They're trying to get it to learn how to play Mario. So it starts off, by and large, just sort of falling down pits, walking into Goombas, or maybe actually just walking the wrong way. It will try and walk left. And it just reaches the wall and goes, I don't know what's going on, man. I'm good. And they keep going, but eventually it gets better. And what they realized was, yeah, we can actually create a half-decent Mario player. But how do we get access to source code? Nintendo's not just going to give up their source code. Again, we're back to this problem. So they used something called Infinite Mario Brothers. And Infinite Mario Brothers was actually sort of a side project by a guy called Marcus Person, who most of you might know as that guy who made Minecraft. This is one of his many side projects. One thing to appreciate is Minecraft was never intended to make him a billionaire. Minecraft was simply something that he was doing, and but lo and behold, it actually became so big that it became a full-blown product, and he made a lot of money out of it. This seems to be pretty much how this guy works. He likes to just muck about with stuff. And what he did was he tried to replicate the original Mario mechanics as faithfully as possible in Java. And I've got a bit of footage of it here. You can actually see the original Infinite Mario Brothers as it worked. <clears throat> you can download this for free, by the way, if you want to sit and play it in the house. So, very Mario-esque. Goombas, Koopa Troopas, shells, mushrooms, basic jumping mechanics. The level design's a bit rough. The level design doesn't have that Nintendo polish, but that isn't really what we were interested in. We just wanted to see whether or not if he had an engine sufficient to do what we wanted to do. This level isn't that good. I don't really like it. 
but all the mechanics are there and it largely works. We got the gist of that? So in 2009, at the same time as when Julian and Sergey published the paper, they announced a competition. And they said, right, everybody, make the very best Mario player you can. Here's the toolkit. We've adapted that source code so that you can then write your own AI player. And we'll let's see just how good you are. And the first track they ever meant it was just gameplay. Just make a, make a player, make him as good as you possibly can. So they had a whole host of people from all over the world in terms of people that were using reinforcement learning algorithms where it learns from stupidity. That is pretty much how reinforcement learning works. Remember when you, you ever put your hand on something hot, you go, ow, and you don't do it again? Reinforcement learning. You learn from making silly mistakes. Or evolution, where it was gradually evolving and becoming smarter and smarter. But some people went for a more kind of simple system. And one of the most simplest AI algorithms, as my final years will tell you, because they just were taught it, is A star search. And along comes a PhD student from Imperial College in London, going by the name of Robin Baumgarten, who did this. This is the top ranked Mario AI player that came out on the very first year the competition ran. It crushed everything at the competition by about a country mile. What you're seeing on the screen is the red line is how the system is calculating per frame how to get to the right side of the screen without hurting itself. And in fact, it cheats because this, what we find out is that this uh, clone of Mario isn't perfect and it actually isolates a bug in, the origin, in this code, which we should see, I think, in a moment from now. But its level of accuracy is absolutely insane. Here we go. You can't do that. You're not supposed to be able to do that. And no human probably wouldn't have figured out to do that either. And you can see sometimes there are multiple lines because what's it doing is it's realized that one path was potentially a dead end. So it tries to search for an alternative. So it searches for all viable options and it does this frighteningly quickly. You can do this within the frame rate of the game. I think the game runs at like, uh, there it goes, it's running at 24 frames a second. At every frame it recomputes what that path is going to be. That caused a bit of a stir. It's really, like, oh, right. I think the competition's over. <laughs> Crap. And what they did was they actually had to respond to this because learning approaches were still trying to figure out the fundamentals. And a learning algorithm, an AI learning algorithm, just figures out by itself how to play it. Whereas when you write an A star search, you, you, you use what is known as a heuristic which is a sort of rule of thumb guide on how to go somewhere. And what that heuristic probably would have been is something along the lines of um, taking this action will get you closer to the edge of the map and also you're minimizing the amount of damage you take. It's also an admissible heuristic because it probably will guess, it'll underestimate the value of that action compared to the reality. But yeah, A star search solved the problem. And everyone was like, oh, right, crap, okay. Uh, next competition then, Galaga, I don't know, uh, Mario 2, Sonic. Um, what they did was they actually continued to run the competition, but the learning approaches were, were put in a separate track. They said, we'll treat you separately because you're actually having to deal with the problem in a completely different way because the AI has to learn completely from scratch how to play the game. The gameplay track after that, you know, didn't really, nothing else came of that because, excuse me, uh, Robin, pretty much solved the problem in one year. Well done, thanks for that. If you actually find that video on YouTube, it's got like a couple of million hits because everyone was genuinely blown away by it. It's like, oh my God, that's how it works. So <clears throat> the, comp the competition organizers figured that we have to do something else. And they realized that they were actually sitting on something that was really interesting. Like I said earlier, the, the, the level design that we saw was kind of rubbish in the original Infinite Mario. It wasn't that great. Well, what happens if we make the competition about creating the levels? Procedural generation of Mario levels would be quite interesting. So they actually added this as a track. And there are, in fact, there's researchers, most notably one of the competition organizers, uh, Noor Shaker, who is a postdoctoral uh, researcher now at the IT University of Copenhagen. That is her entire research career has been built around algorithms that make Mario levels or platforming levels. That is, that is pretty much what she now does for a living. She's probably one of the most foremost authorities on that topic as well. 
and her work that she does is absolutely amazing. So they opened up the competition, <coughs> I think, twice for the uh, level generation. And I've picked out some that were actually available online to watch. And let's see if this video is actually going to run. There we go. So this is one by a fellow called Ben Weber over in America. And what his system does is it tries to get an inclination as to the player's ability. And it will run a couple of sample levels to try and figure out just how good you are. And then it will add content to the Mario level in chunks. And now this is actually a human playing this level. And it goes through it on an iterative process. It starts by creating a base geometry. It will then try and add hills, maybe add uh, some other background geometry it might need. Every now and then though, as you might have noticed, it creates something a little bit odd because the algorithms allowed for that to happen, such as random piranha plants just appearing all over the place. That was valid in the context of the system, so the, the PCG system figured out it could add it. So once it built the basic levels, it builds the pipes, it then adds you know, flying bullet bills. You're not going to get that anywhere else. So it was a little bit weird, but the, what they were doing... Once, once it actually finished, when that particular one finished the algorithm, it would then add all the bricks, it would add the power-ups, and it was done. And what they did in the competition was they weren't trying to figure out how to make a Mario level, because that's too difficult. There's only maybe a handful of people in the world that know what a Mario level looks like, and they all work at Nintendo. And you know, Ma no, Nintendo have never been that open about their design principles. So it was more about, can you make a level that's interesting? And uh, what interesting was could vary from judge to judge, but several human judges would play each of the levels and then decide whether or not they really liked it. So, like I said, this system was based upon your player ability. So what happens if you take Robin's AI bot and plug it into this PCG system? It dies a lot. <laughs> One of the things that's really interesting about this video is that it actually identifies a bug in Robin's bot right here. It doesn't know where to go because it just can't figure out how the hell to get out of that corner without getting itself killed and lo and behold it dies. So of course this was a little while after the original software had been released and we're like oh hey look at that it's finding bugs in it but the level's absolutely bonkers. You couldn't play that. It wouldn't last five minutes. It can't even last like 50 seconds. It's absolutely ridiculous. Oh, there he's cheating again. <laughs> I still love the bullet bills with wings. That's still my favorite thing that this system generates. And this is, you know, like I say, it's a big thing. People are continuing to do it. And this was just one of many. Um, some of the other algorithms <laughs> were... <coughs> Oops. Some of the other algorithms were interested in, they sort of inferred human design logic. What the hell? Um, they sort of inferred human design logic where they said, well, actually, a Mario level will have certain chunks in it that they then tried to inject in it. So it would build the rough level and then it would Marioify it in bits. But I just love this one purely because Ben had, caught, had ran it against Robin's AI system. Now, you can see that these are playable. Some, the geometry is a little bit off. But this is, again, because we're inferring our own understanding of how Mario levels look. But it's kind of fun to play. You can download all these. Um, some people have made their level generators public, and you can download it, and you can try it out yourself. But yeah, that pipe seems to be a big problem right there. Hmm. So this is a continuing thing. People are still doing this to this day. And it actually lives on in what's now referred to as the platformer AI competition. The Mario AI competition stopped in 2012 because Nintendo found out about it. And uh, I think the subsequent year, Julian Tugelius then presented at a conference. I think it was the IEEE Computational Intelligence and Games 2013. And the opening slide for his talk about his Mario research was a copy of the cease and desist letter he'd received from Nintendo. I think he's got it framed somewhere. He's really proud of that. Um, so what they decided to do was they've actually uh, moved away from that and they're actually now using Super Tux, which is a sort of Mario-esque 
uh, art style that you see on Linux. It's a Linux game. Um, however, for particularly for those who are interested, and namely my students who are interested, there is actually a paper by uh, Julian Norshaker, Sergei, and also one of the other organizers, Yergos Yanakakis, who is now based at the University of Malta, um, just titled The Mario AI Championship 2009 to 2012. If you're remotely interested in this, it gives you a broad overview of everything that they did and all the kind of interesting submissions that were made during that period. So, let's move on to something completely different. First person shooters. We haven't done a first person shooter yet. In fact, we've been sticking out, we've been hanging out in the 80s. We've just been doing platforming games or maze navigation games. <coughs> so, someone came up with the idea. In fact, there was some early research going on in sort of the early 2000s, mid 2000s, where people had started playing around with first person shooters. Specifically, as I recall, some people were working on Quake 2. But, you know, Quake's rubbish. So, let's go and work on a more interesting game. So, Unreal Tournament came about. And this was largely organized by Philip Hingston, uh, who's a researcher over in Australia, who was interested in having a competition that was built around online FPSs, but not in the way you think. So you're thinking, oh yeah, create a bot. And you can see people do this online. They mod uh, their games so that they have, a hack, they have a hack bot, an aim bot, which will automatically shoot and kill players. He's like, well, that's too easy. Because there's actually a fidelity of control in first-person shooters that humans aren't very good at, but AI would be great at it. To figure out, well, actually, why not make it that it's an AI that plays against opponents, but the trick is that the opponents don't know that it's a bot. They think it's actually human. And this refers back to something that we have that's called the Turing test. And the Turing test is this test where it's all about the notion of convincing humans that an AI system is actually a human being. Typically, it's built around chatbots. And this is an annual thing that runs quite frequently where people make chat IM bots, which you then sit down at a machine and you talk to the bot and you, like to, you wait to see its response and you have a conversation with it. And the idea is that you're hoping to fool the player into, into, into the user into thinking that you're actually human. And they mix it up between bots and humans and you have to figure out whether or not you, the one that you think is human is actually a bot. So they developed this in Unreal Tournament 2004. I think there was a plugin for it they called Pogamut. And I've built, I've nabbed this particular video where someone is talking about how they made their own bot. That's video, the video is running. So this started out in 2008. And the way that the, the system works is that you have three players in a server. One of them is a bot. One of them is a human, and the other one is also a human, but it's a judge. And the judge only has one gun, and it's a judging gun. So the judge has to follow the other two players around while they're having this fight to the death, and shoot the one that they think is actually the AI. In fact, the problem that then comes with that is that both the other players can kill the judge. Because that's part of the process. Because you want to then see, well, what happens if I interfere? Do, does either of them gravitate towards me? Do they fight? Do they attack me? Now, I've actually had the pleasure to say, I didn't write a bot for this, but I was actually one of the human players at the 2008 competition because it took place at the University of Western Australia at the Computational Intelligence and Games Conference in 2008. I was actually publishing a couple of papers at the time and they needed a, another Unreal Tournament player. And they said, can you play FPSs? I'm like, yeah, man. I'm like, could you help us out? So when we were playing it, I'm just sitting in a room with four other human players and four guys who literally went and clicked a button at the start of the round to turn on their AI bot. And the judges were in a different room on the other side of the building trying to figure out who was who. And ultimately, the only way to win the competition was to, con to actually fool the majority of judges into thinking that your bot was human. And there's a really interesting problem there, because how do you then define what is human play in a first-person shooter? Well, to me, actually, one of the most obvious things is mistakes. Humans are far more fallible. They're gonna, you know, they'll take shots at you. They're actually going to miss that shot. They might not take you out. Um, their navigation could be a little bit sloppy. It, their behavior won't be as rigid. So there's a really kind of difficult challenge there. First, building a smart player 
and then almost dumbing it down to the point that you can convince other people that it isn't actually been written by a piece of software. Now, this competition ran for several years, and in fact, it recently ended because somebody finally won it. They managed to convince the majority of judges that the player was in fact a bot. And one of the biggest things that came out of it was actually a, a then a healthy, rather healthy debate on whether or not the process by which they were assessing them was valid. Because some people were angry at the fact that certain bots had actually won. But you know, AI scientists, we get a little bit grouchy about these things. Scientists in general get a little bit grouchy about these things. But it was a great competition to watch. Because in addition, 2K, who are video game developer, most people now know them because they do things like 2K Sports, but also Borderlands, offered $7,000 to the winning team. And that pot sat there until somebody finally won it. I really should have participated in this. I don't know why I didn't think about it. It's like $7,000, man. Get, get, get money. Okay. Sure, even by the exchange rate, I'm pretty sure that's still, wor still be worth my while. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's plenty more footage on this, and I will jump ahead a little bit. That when it finally finished, that was it. People had the money. This is still going on. And in fact, the notion of human-like judging still crops up a lot in competitions. The Mario AI competition did actually have a Turing track where you had to try and create a Mario that was more human. And again, so you look at what Robin did with that A star bot, and you go, well, that's not in any way human. So how can you make something that looks human-like? What properties evoke humans, I guess? And if you go over to botprize.org, that's actually the full website with all the, uh, actually refers to all the research publications from it and the results from previous competitions. So to finish off going through like, the series of games that I'm talking about, we'll end on StarCraft. Again, something big, something different, immensely popular. StarCraft's a big thing, and pretend, you know, depending on where you go in the world, um, particularly if you look at the likes of South Korea, there's a massive number of competitive players in South Korea. The South Korean competitive players tend to trump most other players in the area. Um, but also, from an AI perspective, StarCraft's kind of interesting because it again presented a very a different problem. So we've traditionally been looking at uh, like platformers, maze navigation, first person shooters changed it up a little bit. But here, when you're dealing with real time strategy games, you've got to start thinking about your resource acquisition. You've got to go out, you've got to acquire resources, you've got to build your bases. Excuse me, typically when you are navigating the world, there's a fog of war. How do you explore the environment around you? How do you then ensure that if once you've found where your enemy is, how do you deploy, how do you deploy like, your armies to make sure that you win? There is a large number of research still going on to this day. In fact, I saw numerous talks about StarCraft AI research recently at a conference in North Carolina, which was the Artificial Intelligence for Interactive Digital Entertainment, or ADA for short. God, thank God for acronyms. And yeah, people are still continuing to work on this to this day. There's an annual competition that still runs. Anybody can enter it if you're a massive StarCraft fan. <coughs> excuse me, you can go ahead, write your own bot and submit it to the competition. Now, what I've pulled up here, just to give you an indication of what the competition's interested in, is this is the final, this is the final game runs uh, for the StarCraft competition in 2012. And this is uh, player Iyer on the left versus Skynet. Skynet is in fact the top player and has been the top player for about the last three years. In fact, only this year, Skynet was actually defeated. Amazingly, they didn't really change it for about three years in a row. They were like, oh, we'll make a couple of tweaks, fix a couple of bugs in it. But it was largely the same system. Now, this competition is ran largely by, uh, if I remember right, it's a team over at the University of Alberta. Uh, Michael Burrow uh, is a researcher who is pretty much in the entire time I've met him has only really been interested in StarCraft, StarCraft, and more StarCraft. His entire research portfolio is about AI research applied to real-time strategy games. Again, yes, people actually get away with this sort of thing for a living. Now, the competition is largely based on skirmishes. They don't focus on the base construction that heavily. Naturally, you have to get your bases up to a certain level so you can actually then fight back against one another. But it's all about 
you know, fights to see who can win it ultimately at the end. So there's a lot of effort that has to be put into terms of how many units that you build, certain types of units that you build, what is the risk of using certain units over others. There is actually a small, unless I'm mistaken, there is actually a certain advantage to playing as one side over the other in StarCraft. I'm not that good at StarCraft, so don't hold me to that point. Um, there's also then, if you're going to work, how do you then coordinate your attacks? Do you then spread yourself out accordingly so that they can only minimize how many targets that the player can actually attack? And it's a big deal. A lot of people still work on it. It's interestingly though, as you watch it now and you think, oh, this is actually quite intense. There's a lot of big battles that can take place. StarCraft AI players are still but a shadow of their human counterparts. Um, they have actually had the, the luxury of bringing in, they've invited and subsequently had accepted uh, professional StarCraft players have came in and played against these bots. By and large, they get trounced. The human players are significantly faster in their strategic decision making and how many clicks that they can actually achieve per second, actions that they can achieve per minute, they're significantly faster than AI because they can actually see things on a much greater level. And in terms of the research end, it's, it's working in a different area because we're dealing with abstract decision thinking, you know, decision making, we're having to think about planning systems. And that's a lot more different compared to uh, the likes of Mario, which is far more reactive in nature. So we're usually looking at short, quick decision making, whereas this is far more long term and deliber deliberative. So like I say, sadly, they haven't got it working in StarCraft 2 yet. They've got a nice API, it works really well with StarCraft 1, and they continue to do that. So that works out quite nicely. So at the risk of potentially overrunning, oh good, we should be good for time. We'll skip on a little bit, but I'll give a link to that video afterwards. Um, that video is about half an hour long, if not longer. It's every possible match that they played at that competition. Sadly, the replay video for 2014 wasn't ready yet, so I couldn't show that, and I just went with that one. Um, like I say, if you go to webdocs.cs.ualberta.ca, um, the link there is actually where the StarCraft AI competition is held, and all the rankings, you can actually pull down the replay data. If you want to sit and watch the replays in StarCraft, you can see every match that they play, and it gives you a full blow-by-blow -blow account of what they're doing. Um, as far as I know, the, the competition will continue, and it'll be back next year. So that's just a kind of rough overall view of what people are doing. There's a lot of different games that people are exploring, but these are some of the big ones that people gravitate towards. And in the future, people are trying to you know, look at other games, looking at other problems and saying, well, what else can we still be solving given that we seem to have identified areas of interest? Procedural generation for levels. All right, okay, that's cool. Um, Non-player character control in Pac-Man, which we're still kind of dealing with. We haven't solved the problem yet. It's still a very difficult problem to tackle. Um, some of the stuff that's been coming up in recent years is looking at player modeling, where you look at what somebody is doing in a game, and then you can actually infer knowledge about their behavior because of what they're doing at runtime. Um, one project, which took place a couple of years ago, uh, was conducted by Yergis Yanakakis and one of his PhD students, and they got talking with the developers of Tomb Raider Underworld. And I think anybody who played that game on Xbox Live within a six month period, um, they pulled down every piece of data they could of you on Xbox Live and then actually did data mining to find out how you play Tomb Raider. What they discovered was that people don't play Tomb Raider the same as each other. There are some people who are largely chickens who will refuse to fight any enemy that appears in the map. There are some people who are terrible at jumping and their jump coordination is so bad it takes them several iterations to actually get it right. There are some people who will actively avoid jumping across gaps. They'd rather fall down the side and then find a way back up. And there are people that will just eliminate anything that moves. If any enemy comes towards you, they will eliminate it as quickly as possible and then move on. Sort of moving into sort of Bartle's player types a uh, number of different player types that exist, but they were actually able to establish that. Another thing that's came up literally just this year was the notion of developing AI that can play any video game you give it. And that's referred to as the General Video Game AI Competition. 
where the idea is that they have an engine which can generate an Atari, like a game that you would expect to see in an Atari 2600. So things like Space Invaders or Frogger or even a crude Pac-Man. Um, Missile Command, you know, old school games from like the early 80s. And what it will do is you just have one piece of AI code, one AI bot, and it has to be able to play any of them as effectively as possible. And you're scored on how well you can actually do it. In fact, I participated in the competition. I wrote a bot and submitted it. And I scored in the middle of the table with a star search. The same thing that Robin used in Mario. Because I actually wanted to see, because this is the biggest problem, because I don't know what the video game is, I can't give it my expert knowledge beforehand to tell it how to maximize its score. So what my bot did was it actually tried to roughly guess what game you were playing based upon the interactions that happened. So if you happened to shoot a missile and it killed someone, and I got a score increase, I'd go, oh, so shooting things gives me more score. Then it would actually tell it in the A-star search to maximize shooting things. That's what my bot did. One of the, the biggest uh, approach to that problem was referred to, known as Monte Carlo Tree Search. And that's an AI algorithm that, if you imagine you stand in one spot, and then make a rough guess of doing everything you possibly could in front of you. So imagine you go, okay, I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna do this, and then I'm just gonna do a whole bunch of random moves until either I win, or I lose, or I die, and then I figure out, oh, doing this might be a good idea. And it records that information. And then it does it with a completely different set of actions. And it does this repeatedly, like several thousand times in the space of a fraction of a second, and then when it goes, okay, I've done all this exhaustive search, I'll do that. Then it does the whole thing again. Now that seems a little bit nuts, but it's insanely powerful. It's actually became the biggest AI algorithm out there since, I was going to say sliced bread, but that doesn't really work. This sort of kicked off around 2007, 2008. Um, people started using it in Klondike Solitaire. It then became huge in Computer Go. It's pretty much revolutionized the area of, of uh, playing Go, the board game, or gem game, I suppose it is. It's now being used in video games, and in the GVG AI competition, I think something like over 50% of the submitted bots were MCTS. In fact, the third place bot was the sample Monte Carlo Tree Search player they gave you for free when you signed up to the competition. Now, I was about 12, I think, and about 22. But there were people who wrote their own MCTS bots that performed poorer than mine. And there were people that actually took the sample code and changed it, and it performed worse than the sample bot they gave you. It's kind of weird when you actually have to give the bronze medal to the sample code. So two humans won it, and like, I suppose Diego uh, Perez, who's the PhD student down in Essex who helped run the competition, and uh, yeah, he's like, oh, here's a little sample MCTS bot. It works kind of well at one third place. The hell. But this is going to be a continuing thing, and they're going to keep iterating with that. And I, in fact, I know a little bit about what the competition is going to do next year. I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to it. In the meantime, <clears throat> I'm working on this as well. Several students will probably know all about this already. Um, and in fact, uh, Dan, who's sitting in the back of the hall, uh, has been working with me, he's been doing all most of the coding, I had to get to take all the credit, um, on our own approach to this, where we decided we would look at Spelunky. Now, we actually published a paper on this about in August of this year at the IEEE Computational Intelligence and Games 2014. It was over in Dortmund. And it went down really well. But the funny thing was, <clears throat> it was a bit of a tough sell. Because we're saying to them, right, we've actually got an API that plugs into the original version of Spelunky, into the source code. You can write your own bot in C++, and then it will execute in-game. And you can be like, right, okay, let's see how good my bot is. Because the thing is that Spelunky is actually quite a hard problem. It's sort of an amalgamation of what Pac-Man and Mario do, in the sense that you've got to navigate an environment, a hazardous environment, collect items, and ultimately reach a goal. But of course the goal is a lot harder to reach because the map procedurally generates. And you have a finite number of resources. You sometimes have to blow up the map in order to get to an exit, and you need to have a bomb to do that. Now, the thing is, 
Show of hands, how many people here know of or have played Spelunky? Now you see, this is my kind of audience. We pitched this to a room of biggest, you know, the best and brightest minds in AI interested in games, and literally two people put their hand up. Two people out of probably the same number of people that are here right now. So we had a sort of 11th hour idea that we wanted to show off just how hard this can be. And with that, we presented this video at the conference. To say that's a little bit unorthodox at an AI research conference it was, you know, is a bit of an understatement. So we were a little bit panicked about this, but this actually solved our problem very quickly because some people immediately appreciated, you know, there's 101 ways you can die in Spelunky and that it's actually quite a rich problem <clears throat> to the point that we're now continuing to work on this. And, you know, Dan's working with me on it. And in fact, recently I had Brandon and Jordan also helping out a little bit over the weekend at our Spelunky Jam. Thanks very much for that. Because we're trying to iron out all the kinks in the system so that people can then actually try their hand at making their own <coughs> Spelunky bot. Because we've only made a handful so far. But we aren't really getting to this point where we can show off something akin to what Robin did. Because we haven't made that call. But in the meantime, we've been messing around with it ourselves. And so we showed off the very first scripted bots that were made by Daniel and one or two other students, largely as friends, in fact, um, at the conference. And this was the video that we then showed. If it actually changes. <coughs> and we're honest about it. So Gold Digger does exactly what the name suggests. It just looks for the nearest gold, it acquires all the gold it can in the level, and in fact, when it runs out of gold, it just dies, because it doesn't know what else to do. The Sean Bean should be obvious. <laughs> just jumps on the nearest set of spikes to kill itself. Jetpack Joyride will then try and grab the nearest jetpack and use that to get to the exit. Shotgun Total Warrior, clever play on words a little bit there, but it then tries to kill all the enemies it can get a hold of by using the shotgun. It's a little bit of trouble trying to jump over the gaps sometimes, but he makes it eventually. Discovery Dan, which is one of my favourites, he actually just explores the world until he can find the goal. Because the thing is that when you start the level, he can't see everything. He actually has to explore the world to find the exit. As soon as he finds it, he takes it. Indy is actually the best one, I think. Um, grabs the golden idol and then runs out the exit as fast as he possibly can. I think he's just afraid that there's going to be a giant boulder chasing him or something like that. So we're continuing to work on this and I'm hoping that this time next year we've actually got a lot more to talk about there. Because the response to this has been incredibly positive to the point that I know that there are actually a couple of researchers 
um, overseas who I'm in contact with because they are now working with the Spelunk Bot API to make their own uh, AI bots. And in fact, we are still doing that here, but we're trying to continue to tweak and refine the API. <laughs> I'm super excited because I'd love to see where this is going to be in 12 months' time. And uh, yeah, hopefully next year I can talk a little bit more about it. And so, with that, and I think I've managed to do this with six minutes to spare, this is essentially the end of the first part of this series. Like I said, if you want to know a little bit more, I would check out the Patreon feed, patreon.com forward slash AI underscore and underscore games. And I, all my posts that I do on behalf of this series prop up on there, and you can find all the YouTube videos. So before I finish, I will give a little teaser. Two weeks today, part two of this series will happen. And I thought I'd just finish off with the opening screen for what part two is going to be about. Part two is based on a piece that I've previously done referred to as Arkham Intelligence because, well, this all came about because I really like the Batman Arkham games. And those are made by, largely by Rocksteady Studios who are based here in the UK. There is one game that hasn't been made by them. I think it was uh, Warner Brothers Montreal made Batman Arkham Origins because right now Rocksteady are a little bit busy working on Arkham Knight which comes out next year. And I get really interested in this. I just had one of those moments where I thought, how does the AI work? For those of you who've never played the game, it's all about being Batman. It actually evokes of a lot of Batman. And one of the best parts of the game is the stealth missions, where you actually hide typically above the enemy and you manipulate them to get to a point where you can take them all down one by one. And you note that the AI actually changes over time. It becomes more panicked. It makes sloppy mistakes. You can lure it into traps. And I thought, how does that work? So I went away and figured it all out. So what we're going to do in the next session is we're going to first give a, a kind of walk through of what the systems are in play, how those systems actually work, how the development team actually worked quite heavily, their art team, their art and animation team worked really heavily with their AI team and how they managed to go through a period of iterative development and improvement to build this AI systems in play. And perhaps most interestingly, how many silly AI, like how many silly things that they were doing in development actually then became part of the final product. And we'll also have people do me a favor and come up and actually play a little bit of Batman on the projector so we can go through it in real time and we can actually see what's happening. And so with that, thank you very much. And if we've got any questions, now is the time. No one wants the question. <laughs> Drank my juice. Yes? What's, uh, what's your favourite AI in the game? I don't know, actually. That's a tough one. Um, I don't, uh, probably t two different answers to that. Um, I'm a big fan of the Batman Arkham stuff, largely because, and this is something that will be revealed in the next talk, is that it's fundamentally very simple. So from, a, from a, an AI researcher's perspective, the Batman stuff I love because it's a very simple system that has some very intelligent design about it. That w what happened was that game actually won the Game AI of the Year from AIGameDev.com, which is one of the biggest websites dedicated to industry practices in AI for games. And they were asked to give a speech. And they went, oh, we just did this. And the whole room's like, what? They thought it was far richer in context than it is in execution. It's actually just very smart design. Um, from a, I'd say in terms of execution, I'm a big fan of the Fear series because the Fear series actually has a series of AI that will plan itself out of situations and it reacts accordingly. And again, this is this weird thing when you learn a bit more about it, that there's an awful lot more going on under the hood, but it's actually, again, really clever systems built um, to do really, really awesome things. Probably before I actually found out what it did, Left 4 Dead's director system. Because what it achieves is actually very, very hard to do. It's trying to manage an experience. And trying to quantify experience management is actually quite difficult. How do you maintain or un un even model a player's excitement or a player's panic to the point where you go, okay, we need to ramp it up or we need to ramp it down? 
how, how do you do that? And I thought that was really cool that there was this, it was the first time we'd ever seen it where an AI was actually overseeing an entire game and then going, okay, <laughs> put some zombies over there, we'll put a tank over here, we'll put a witch over there, go. Oh, no, he's finding it a bit hard, right, ramp, nope, nope, ease up on how many zombies we've got. No, there we go, let them, let them heal, yes, let them heal, yes. <laughs> More zombies! And I thought that was really cool, so... Again, that might be one that you'll see at a later talk because I have actually done a bit of reading into how that works and what they did to actually achieve it. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, in gaming, like, do you reckon there's any particular genre that actually puts the most effort into their AI, like real time strategy or something like that, or is it all just a company sort of just trying to make the that they can? So, for those of you who didn't hear the question, it's like, which genre of games do you think actually spends the most time working on their AI systems? It's a tough one. Um, I'd probably say real-time strategy games and first-person shooters. And now that's an interesting thing because real-time strategy games, they actually need to think about this a lot because you want to make sure that the game is challenging but not immensely difficult. And one series that does a lot of work in that is Total War. Creative Assembly, um, who are based down south, I think it's in Horsham if I remember right, um, they've actually done a lot of work adopting AI principles actually AI research methods into their games. And Total War has continued to do that. Interestingly, Total War is also the first commercial game I've ever heard of that uses Monte Carlo Tree Search. Because the big problem with that is that, like I said, it does all these random things, and then it makes one decision. So it's incredibly computationally expensive. But researchers have been going, look at this, this is great. You don't even need to write heuristics. It figures it out by itself. And they went away and figured out how to get it to work. It's in Total War Rome 2. It does all the um, resource acquisition and management. And I was genuinely blown away by that. So they put a lot of effort into that because they want to make this experience as engaging as possible. Now the weirdest one is first person shooters where you have some of the most kind of really clever and thoughtful processes into how you can make director systems and non-player characters. And then you have Call of Duty. Now I'll, I'll be perfectly blunt, the AI in Call of Duty is awful. It has three states, run towards you and hope that you don't shoot it just yet, run towards you and hope you shoot it right now, and hide behind cover and then I'll pop out and let you shoot me in the head. That is it, that is all it does. It's not that engaging, because Call of Duty is more interested in the Hollywood experience in the sense that they're designed to die, and you're going to kill them as quickly as possible, because it's, again, it's part of that empowerment. Conversely, a lot of games, and I'm going to look particularly, well, we talked a, bit, a little bit about fear earlier, but Far Cry three and four, but also the Crisis Trilogy spend a lot of time on their AI systems. And particularly Crisis, one of the things that Crisis has to deal with is that you're wearing this power suit. And then of course, how does the AI then compensate for that? So one of the first things they had to do was have a shooting character who knew when to go to cover, but also when to hunt for you because your cloak activated and you're hiding from them. Um, so a lot of it is clever attempts to optimize existing algorithms. And you'd be amazed with how much they can get away with using just bare bone. That A-star search from the Mario, a lot of systems still just use the A-star search and they can use it to frightening effect because they optimize it so well. But also just very smart design to the point that it, half of AI in games is about fooling the player into thinking it's a lot smarter than it actually is. And I love what they're doing there. Also similarly in Far Cry, they put a lot of effort into having layers of systems working together because it generates emergent gameplay. And when you're navigating in Far Cry 3, for example, if you're wandering around the island, it decides where to place enemies for you to fight against. But it also is, is smart in the sense that it doesn't leave AI wandering around uh, two kilometers away from you because it's not useful. So what they do is they actually pick them back out the island and they put them somewhere else. So they go, well, he's actually heading that way, so let's move those two guys over here and then we'll just wait and see if he bumps into them again. So, because it's always trying to manage that experience and to make it as fun as possible. So, um, definitely RTS and FPS, probably, more than anything else. Yes? How does the base AI, so like the story missions in Starcraft, have they <coughs> been against the actual AI that we shot? I don't know, actually. You should probably go and have a look at that. Largely, it's been focused on playing against one another. Or 
I think some of the earliest, pre-StarCraft, there used to be another RTS competition. Uh, I think it was the ORTS, because it was an open source real-time strategy sy system that they built, <coughs> and it was all about how well they could build their bases within a certain time frame, managing the resources, and then potentially going into conflict with one another. <coughs> I don't, can't think of any time when they've actually tried to put it in the campaign. They probably should, actually. That'd be worth checking out. Anybody else? Or have I successfully exhausted you all? Yes? Well, yeah, Spelunky's a roguelike. Well, I suppose it depends on... I mean, some people have looked at develop... Oh, they actually have worked on their own roguelikes. But roguelikes haven't really appeared as a dominant uh, or kind of very interesting domain, I think, for a, lot of for a lot of researchers. I think it's actually because of the largely random and also uh, rather punishing uh, kind of design of those games because that's it if it's a roguelike as soon as you die once that's it game over you have to go all the way back to the beginning so we've been sort of toying with that notion with Spelunky in the sense that we might have start out with people learning against test levels that we make but then just do a marathon run at the end and it's like, okay right we've seen that you're pretty good on these test levels now we're just going to let you play the whole game it could actually be a kind of cool thing where we just let, get to see every year how far someone can get through Spelunky I mean, what, the speedruns can now do it around, what, the 10-minute mark or less? Two minutes. Two, two minutes? Yeah, use it to teleport. Oh, God. See, this is the problem. <clears throat> that's a lot of inferred knowledge right there. Someone's able to... I can't beat Spelunky yet. I still haven't beat it. I like to say it's because I've been too busy. It's not from a lack of ability. But I think roguelikes could actually kick off in the future because if we can actually kind of really challenge ourselves and push ourselves and go, right, here's a game that's going to be so rich in its mechanics, but you've got one shot to get it right. That might actually push people to think a lot harder about edge cases that they might crop up against in their, in their bots that they're writing. And I think we're about done. Well, with that, thank you very much to all of you who've came out. And by all means, stick around for two weeks from now and we'll come back and talk a little bit more about Batman. Thank you.